up to about up to about 11, 12, uh, we get uh, the series at, at 2004, five prices. Uh, so, so I've used that, that series, uh, but after uh, 11, 12, from 12, 13, you know, we switched to prices at, uh, at, at 11, 12, actually. So that I had to convert back at, at four, five. So there's a little bit of uh, modification that, that naturally happens here. Uh, after 11, 12, uh, but, but you know, I've done the series as well as you can do uh, with, with what we got. So, so this is the uh, 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 series that gives you the real per capita income starting at 50, 51. The main points to note are, are the mark, markers which I've shown here. You take first 30 years and, and you can see the line is flat. And, 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 and so no surprise, you know, you come to 80, 81, 30 years later, um, you've raised per capita income by, you know, about a little more than 50%, uh, 156, it goes to from 100. Extremely slow growth. This is really, uh, you know, no perceptible change, you know, on an annual basis, we are looking at it. <laughs> uh, you, you, you are not even, you know, going from 100 to 102 in one year. Uh, on average, uh, it's it's uh, it's less than that, uh, right? I mean, that will also require for this number to be 160. So extremely slow, not perceptible. Uh, it almost looks like you know hardly anything is changing. Uh, uh, now you know, 30 years later, of course, some change. Uh, I mean, that's a 50 percent change in per capita income, but but still nothing nothing very. Uh, um, you know, that, that nothing that really, really changed things very much. It is, gets a little better and, and whatever progress we made in, in, the, in, the first, uh, um, uh, 30, in the first 30 years, roughly that much we are able to make in the next decade, uh, go to 217. Uh, so, uh, right, what you would need is, uh, yeah, in fact, it's a little more than, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have added more than 56 here. You've added about 61 between here and here. So in, in 10 years, you've done more than what you did in the previous 10 year, previous 30 years. Um, and then we do a lot better. We go uh, in the next decade uh, over 90 uh, points here uh, in, in, in terms of the per capita income index. And that after 2000, 2001 is where much of the growth uh, comes through. So presumably, you know, your, your personal memories are pretty much uh, in this period, in, in, in the current millennium. Uh, and uh, even if some of you were born a little before that, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, your conscious memory, uh, this is where you are. So what roughly, you know, in a way, if you, if you look at uh, what changes I saw and what changes you saw happening in India, Economically speaking, not a much difference. Uh, you know, while I grew up, uh, I mean, I left in 1974, but I visited very frequently back. So uh, I know exactly uh, how India has evolved. Really much of the change uh, is, is, is of the last 20 years. Uh, maybe some did happen in the 1990s and now, but that's about it. So really the first question one must, must ask is what happened, you know? Why did we do so poorly? in the, in the uh, first 30 years, uh, what went wrong. So I think that is where uh, the, the beginning was, was bad. Uh, 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 policies were wrong. And, and the impact of that remains. I don't think we have gotten over uh, 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 that uh, still. Uh, Where we started, you know, the, the biggest mistake was that unlike any other country except the Soviet Union, which probably was the model Nehru had chosen, we began by emphasizing the heavy industries. We said we are going to invest in heavy industries. The, the thinking was that, uh, you know, we want to be self-sufficient uh, and uh, how do we become self-sufficient, right? If we are going to become self-sufficient, then we have to be able to sustain uh, investments. How do you sustain investments without producing machinery, without producing steel? Um, 
you know so the 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 objective was that well if we are going to be, become self sufficient uh, we got to learn how to make machinery <laughs> and even make machines that make machines uh, and and so we need heavy industries i think that was perhaps the biggest mistake and and it of course uh, resulted from a desire to achieve self sufficiency so objective was the wrong one also but even then actually you know if one was pursuing the objective of eventual self sufficiency uh, heavy industry should not have been the starting point uh, so so to me it it is the choice of i mean a lot of other mistakes also happened you know in terms of public sector uh, emphasis socialism so which which automatically meant that uh, Uh, the state has to begin to own more and more uh, uh, resources, uh, and and that meant you know state uh, getting into all kinds of production activities and all of those mistakes were also ha- also happened. But but really the central one was uh, uh, I would argue the the focus on heavy industries. What that did really was that at that time you started with your savings at about seven percent of the GDP. and that gdp was itself extremely small so on a small gdp 7% rate of savings you are not going to get much investment and if you say that i am going to not you know invest into heavy industries they will absorb all your investment resources that you got uh, and uh, that of course not also <laughs> what it does is heavy industries don't generate uh, all that many jobs it also meant that if you're going to run these heavy industries you've got to have serious engineers you've got to serious managers and so you invest your whatever small little resources you got for education you go and invest them in higher education uh, so we built up iits we built up iims and uh, the like uh, but primary education then got neglected um, if you you know go back to the discussions of the uh 1955 1956 when the foundations of the current system or or of the system that got adopted were laid down there is hardly any discussion of primary uh, education it begins to appear in the final plan document but if you follow the discussions that happened uh, around uh, the writing or around the initial plan frame hardly any discussion of primary education so lot of the problems arose out of this uh, 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 all the uh, even the labor laws of the organized uh, heavily tilted uh, uh, to 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 cater to the to protecting the interests of the organized labor uh, they began to originate also in this heavy industries sector so i think this is where the mistake happened that meant that therefore you know what what this did did was two things one uh with the, your investment was still limited 7% of a very small gdp is not very much and if you want to then do heavy industries you are not going to get a whole lot of scale so even in heavy industries you will be not globally competitive there was no chance because the scale will still be too little too small more than that then all the other industries were left in the cottage industry sector or small scale sector whatever you want to call it you know village industries cottage industries uh sometimes they used to call them hand industries because largely they were you know work was being done by hands and not much capital so you also did not get any scale there you couldn't so the comparative advantage was in the labor intensive commodities uh, as far as manufacturing was concerned and which is the path that south korea taiwan singapore they took uh but we said no 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 consumer goods industries we are going to do in these hand industries that of course meant you could not get quality you could not get scale there was no way to compete uh, in in the rest of the world so costs were high exchange rate was nominally fixed you know so in a, in a fixed nominal exchange rate when your costs are high in this manner uh, prices are rising over time uh, quality adjusted uh, uh, prices are uh, are even higher uh you know what is going to happen then of course you cannot compete in in, uh, in in most products in the global marketplace and you will have to revert back ultimately to to uh, to very heavy hand of protection which is what happened you ran out of foreign exchange uh, foreign exchange budgeting was a uh, uh, was adopted uh, and that of course sucked up you know uh, 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 that, that, that in effect uh, 
created a very inward looking regime, which of course was consistent with the self-sufficiency objective as well. So nobody objected to it, but, but in effect that, that ultimately led to all sorts of inefficiencies. Uh, so that's a sort of very quick kind of primer on, on where I think we uh, went wrong from the beginning. And, and then of course the, the, the mixture of that uh, you know, with mixture of socialism and democracy together proved deadly as well. Uh, 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 you know, you can do some re redistribution, uh, uh, that, that is fine. But if, 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 if you get into uh, you know, the state owning the industries, then that uh, also potentially undermines, uh, begins to undermine uh, democracy. And, and we did uh, you know, at some point uh, end up with, with an authoritarian regime during the emergency. Um, so in any case, that's the kind of background story. Uh, uh, lots and lots of details, uh, and I've glossed over those. Uh, 1980s, things begin to look like, you know, there's something we are not doing right, uh, 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 but there's no kind of will to actually change the system. Uh, and so we muddle through, but, you know, try to open up a little bit here and there within the existing framework. So some liberalization happens of the investment licensing, some liberalization happens of the uh, import licensing uh, and all. Uh, there is also a lot of fiscal deficits that are run. So, so there is expansionary uh, Im impulse coming from, from running large fiscal deficits as well. So growth does pick up uh, and, and particularly it picks up in the last three years of the 1980s, uh, but it also has the <laughs> impact uh, uh, at that point uh, that, that it begins to create uh, a serious balance of payments problem. Uh, and and that, that has the origins in the fact that, you know, exports are still not very high. Uh, that came from the, from, from the initial set of policies that, that we chose for ourselves. Uh, and then when you also financed a large part of this fiscal deficit by borrowing abroad, your interest payments on and, and debt service basically charges began to rise. Uh, by 1991 or so, you know, about 35% of export earnings were being uh, absorbed by uh, debt service payments. As you're pursuing expansionary policy, import demand is rising very rapidly also, and some imports had been liberalized. So, you know, those imports did expand and all. Uh, and then, of course, you had the, the uh, uh, Iraq invasion by the United States, which led to a big jump in the oil prices. India was a large importer of oil, and so the foreign exchange reserves ran out, balance of payments crisis happened. That's the point at which also we had a change of prime minister uh, for the first time, uh, uh, a Congress prime minister who was not from the Nehru Gandhi family, uh, came to the office, uh, 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 who had also served as a chief minister in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh and seen things from a different uh, window. Uh, and he realized that things needed to change. Uh, so he had the will to do, this is Prime Minister Narasimha Rao, and, and that's where the real kind of liberalization begins. I think there is now, you know, a, a switch rather than work with the old policy framework, framework itself is changed. So it's not tinkering, uh, uh, you know, piecemeal changes here and there, but some major things happen. Investment licensing is completely changed dropped, uh, import licensing is dropped as well, except on consumer goods, that took another decade till 2001. But that also happened, tariffs were liberalized and all. Uh, uh, and, and the short point is that response did happen uh, uh, on growth. So you see the, uh, the per capita incomes rising faster, uh, 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 a process that had begun in the 1980s, but really then picked up in the 1990s and the real effects then, uh, luckily, another prime minister comes in, you know, which is Atal Bihari Vajpayee, uh, uh, from 1998 to 2004. Uh, uh, again, liberalization really kind of uh, uh, takes place at a very fast pace. Uh, uh, and he also then pays a lot of attention to infrastructure building. Uh, 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 you know, we begin to build highways of the kind that you know I'd seen only in the United States, and then uh, 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 
uh, those are the kinds of highways that began to be built up in uh, India. And, and that's where the whole process then uh, took off in a big way. Now, 2003, four is it sort of, you know, from the growth perspective is the watershed year for the, you know, we shifted to a, high, a significantly high growth trajectory. And if I take, you know, now between 2003, four and 1920 is about 17 years. Uh, there are ups and downs and all, but the, but the broad point simply is that during this period, the aggregate growth rate, uh, 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 the average annual growth rate from 2004, three, four, four to 19, eight, uh, to 1920 is 7.4%. And population growth has also by that time slowed down. So even per capita income therefore rises about 6.1%. For a democracy, I think this is the example with the highest growth. I don't think any other democracy in the world on a sustained basis for 17 years has uh, 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 seen uh, growth uh, uh, at 7% at plus uh, for a, a sustained period uh, of the kind that, that we have been able to uh, register in, in, in the last uh, 17 years. Uh, or well, I think you know, we'll come to COVID area, but up until 1920. Okay, so this is where uh, um, uh, we, we come and then of course, uh, 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 I'll come to the nuances of some, some of what, what has happened in more recent years. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, now, uh, when COVID hits, of course, uh, 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 given the, the uh, lack of uh, understanding of the nature of the virus uh, and the threat that seemed at the time, we went into a very, very uh, a tough lockdown uh, in, 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 the, in March, uh, beginning in March uh, 2020. And the quarter that followed April, May, and June, the first quarter of the year 2021 uh, was a massive decline of the growth rate uh, to about 23, 24% negative, right? So the GDP fell by between something like 23 and 24%. Uh, 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 unprecedented, of course, you know, there's never been a quarter like that in the Indian, at least post-independence Indian history. Uh, and that translated uh, at the end uh, uh, in the annual decline of about uh, uh, 7.3 or so, something like that, 7.3%. Um, we have recovered re pretty well. We, we recovered actually quite well. Uh, you know, if you take the, um, e even the last two, second half of um, 2021, uh, the second half of 2021 was already at the pre-COVID level. And uh, then 21-22, uh, the uh, advanced growth estimate is 9.2%. Um, now, of course, that's an estimate will be revised. We'll not, we don't know whether it'll go up or down. Uh, also, you know, you might argue that, you know, this has come uh, on, on a low um, base, which is true, you know, we wouldn't have done 9.2% without that low base. Uh, but on the whole, I think if you compare to the other countries that have recovered, uh, countries that had a similar kind of decline, a large, large number of countries with, uh, with a fairly large uh, uh, decline in the um, uh, growth rate, I mean, of the kind, there were countries that uh, saw a GDP decline even larger than India's uh, France, uh, I think Spain, some of these countries. Anyway, you can look it up. Um, so, so still, uh, uh, for this particular year, uh, uh, so far it seems, uh, and 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 this nine point two percent is very close to the uh, uh, to the forecast that IMF had done, which was nine point five percent. So pretty close. Uh, uh, um, and and I, I, IMF forecast, according to IMF forecast, India at nine point five was to grow faster uh, than any other uh, economy for this year. And so the recovery was, was significant uh, in, uh, in India in IMF's forecast. Uh, China was the next with 8% and China's growth figures have come out. So they're about actually about 8% for the year 21. They do the calendar year figures. We do the, uh, 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 we, we do the fiscal year figures, uh, but, but so it, India has done better, uh, but again, you know, the, the 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 base effect for China was was not as, 
uh, as favorable as, as it was for India. So, so that has to be taken into account. Uh, for the next year, the IMF forecast for India is 8.5%. Uh, and then there's a good chance that this will happen, uh, 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 provided, of course, we don't end up in significant lockdowns. Uh, throughout, the, throughout COVID in the two years, you know, I talked to a lot of uh, um, uh, television anchors and all, and, and one of the things I always say is that, look, you know, um, this anything we say uh, in terms of predictions or what might happen uh, next is very much contingent on uh, how the virus behaves uh, and, and how we have to react then to the behavior of the virus. Uh, uh, that is a big unknown and that remains so. Um, uh, I mean, you know, we keep hoping that, uh, <laughs> that this wave is the last wave, but uh, so far we, we are not sure. Uh, and, and to that extent, one has to be, be careful. Uh, um, okay, so um, that's where we stand right now. Uh, now, in terms of the future prospects, right? In terms of the future prospects, um, this is where I think we are well poised right now. The, uh, uh, now the, 1920 was a year during which uh, this was the last year prior to COVID and the growth rate fell to 4%. This was a very sharp decline, very large decline, uh, uh, something we had not uh, uh, seen since 2008-9, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, the year following the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, and, and that requires a bit of explanation. Uh, as far as in my reading, the, the, the primary factor there was uh, the, the uh, financial sector. Uh, there was enormous amount of reckless lending that uh, happened, you know, most people say 2008 to 14, but actually the origins I see are, are, are even go farther back actually. Um, and, and then there was a restructuring, loan restructuring system in, in place, <laughs> which, you know, gave you automatic restructuring practically. Uh, and so bad loans were never recognized. Uh, and, and the process kept happening. Uh, and, 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 you know, there was no prospect of many of these loans being repaid. They were not recognized that as non-performing on time. Uh, and the accumulation kept happening under the guise of restructured loans. So they will restructure them as, a, as standard loans, not you know, in the rest of the world, when you restructure loans, they have to become non-performing. They have to be classified as non-performing. We allowed actually these to be uh, 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 left as, uh, uh, as performing uh, uh, loans. And uh, in the end, they had to be recognized. So, so, you know, there's a big collapse in credit growth. Uh, and, and then, on the back of it also came the non-bank finance uh, companies and BFCs uh, crisis happened. Uh, that ultimately is, is behind what happened actually to growth, uh, which, which gradually fell, you know, 16, 17, 8.3%, then fell to 7%, then to 6.1, and then to four. Uh, I think we are now in better shape the, uh, the, the uh, balance sheets of both uh, the public sector banks and uh, the corporates uh, are, are in better shape now than, uh, uh, than they were going into the crisis. Thankfully, I think you know, we were all predicting the opposite, but, the, but uh, 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 by all accounts, I think the balance sheets have improved during this period. Um, so that's a big plus, but also during this period, some very important reforms have been uh, 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 undertaken and, and some before that. So I in particular point to four big ticket reforms. Um, you, you got the uh, uh, insolvency in bankruptcy code. I'd been writing for it at least for 50, more than 15 years, almost 20 years. So finally, I think 2016, we put that in place and, and that's now operating fairly successfully. Some minor changes need to be done, but, but the basic structure as, as it exists and as it's operating is, is very good. GST, another major, major reform, uh, a lot of growing pains around that, but I think we have overcome most of the major hurdles in terms of the 
uh, working of the portal and the, the, you know a lot of the gaming that was happening uh, 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 where rebates were being claimed when they, they were not actually due. Uh, that is now being um, pretty much enforced reasonably well. So we, that has reflected itself, of course, also in the rising, very rapidly rising GST revenues. Uh, so GST is the second. Uh, the third uh, is the labor laws. 95% uh, there, some 5% still uh, uh, to go, but legislation does give states the power that they can take that remaining 5% of their step uh, 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 simply through a notification. So, so they don't need to pass any legislation. Uh, and, and this has to do with giving, uh, empowering the firms of all sizes uh, with the right to uh, lay off their workers uh, if they are not performing or, or uh, if they are not uh, 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 being productive. Uh, or for whatever other reason, you know, the, sometimes demand fluctuates also and, and firms have to then lay off workers. Uh, so giving the right uh, to the employers to lay off workers. Uh, currently, the current legislation only gives it to the firms of size 300 or uh, fewer workers, but, but that has to change. Um, but other than that, I think labor law reform has happened. And finally, the fourth big ticket reform is the corporate profit tax, which is now aligned to the global standards, 17% for uh, manufacturing investments and 25% for uh, all the rest. Uh, so I think these four, and these are mutually reinforcing um, reforms. Uh, infrastructure has been built up very, uh, at, 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 a, at a fast pace. It is happening, continuing, that's work in progress and, and moving at, at good brisk pace. Uh, the kind of uh, momentum we had created uh, during Vajpayee era uh, is back now and, and uh, uh, all aspects of it, including the social infrastructure, things like uh, 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 bringing water to the households, uh, Swachh Bharat, uh, toilets, et cetera, uh, inclusive of that, but also from the growth point of view, I mean, building of the roads, building of the bridges, uh, railways, uh, 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 civil aviation, all of that. So that also, uh, well, and then the digital infrastructure, which also India's is one of the best uh, and, and that's producing results. And we are seeing that partly reflected also in the growth of the uh, unicorns that are coming uh, via the startup uh, system. So I think these are the big pluses, which uh, 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 I think will, get India growing seven to 8% uh, uh, on a sustained basis over the next decade, perhaps two decades, uh, um, but India's potential is higher. I think, you know, there's no reason why India cannot get to nine ten percent which is what China did for three decades, which is what uh, South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore did for uh, similarly for about three decades uh, and Hong Kong. Uh, but that requires a bit more work. Uh, now, one of the key things that needs to be done is that India has turned protectionist in the recent uh, years. That has to change. If that doesn't change, I think uh, the, 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 the uh, payoff to all the good reforms that we have done will simply not uh, uh, be maximized. It will fall well short of what can be done. And, and this liberalization has to happen both via the rollback of high tariffs you know, tariffs that are more than 40%, uh, some which even go beyond 100%, they serve nobody's purpose. The only thing they do is to punish the consumer. Uh, I, I think that's, that's completely uh, uh, mistaken. Uh, and and no, no country has built up, you know, uh, no country has transformed in a kind of uh, short period of time uh, uh, following protectionist policies. So, so that's, I think, my priority number one that needs to be done, very important. Uh, among other things, the, 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 the uh, uh, um, privatization of public sector enterprises has to continue. Fortunately, finally, I think, you know, we got a good secretary uh, uh, in, in DIPAM, the, De the Department of Investment and Public Asset Management. Uh, uh, he has, you know, privatized Air India, also privatized... Uh, couple of other uh, uh, units as well. Um, so that pro finally privatization has got off the ground, but it has to speed up, it has to accelerate big time. 
very important public sector banks have to be privatized uh, we can talk about that uh, and uh, you know there is an alternative way to reform but i do not think the alternative will ever be pursued because india's bureaucratic system is such so really short of privatization i don't see that that we will see uh, significant action on public sector banks and that is something very much required because two thirds of the banking assets are still in public sector and and you cannot you know finance is incredibly important uh, for for rapid growth just one last point uh, uh, which i would mention uh, is uh, india's uh, fundamental kind of structural problem which is that the economic units in india uh, in what from whatever angle you look are very small and that needs to change uh, you know if you look at the habitations in india they are very small i mean except you know some mega cities of course we got but but then when you go where is the vast part of our population vast part of population is scattered all over in very small habitats the villages the little bhanis as we call them in rajasthan uh, uh, you know economic activity really requires agglomeration you need to be closer uh, and, and so 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 that but but it, the, the smallness of units your manufacturing activity in very small units you look at the employment structure less than 10% of the total workforce is in enterprises which have 20 or more workers you know i'm not even saying large it is 20 or more workers it is hardly large uh, uh, because i don't have the numbers you know if i want to look for how many uh, workers or proportion of workers in 200 work 200 or more uh, 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 worker enterprises we don't have those numbers but 20 or more less than 10% about 10% you could say that's very small you know 90% of the workers therefore you know 45% in uh, or 42 3% in agriculture the rest are in small little kind of enterprises uh, with very very low productivity the enterprises have to get larger i think you know we revel in saying small in, in in promoting small but but that's not where the economic activity flourishes not productivity flourishes so a lot of the reforms i'm talking about pretty much uh, Uh, are intended to ensure that that larger units appear you have to create these jobs in industry and services so that workers will move out of agriculture to take these good jobs you know most children of the farmers don't want to do farming they want to do you know other things uh, like everybody else uh, and that shows up very clearly in the surveys that uh, that have been done um and and so uh, 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 and you know you, you it cannot be a modern economy with 45% of your workforce in agriculture no no economy has been able to do that so so that transformation out of agriculture into industry and services that is the bigger challenge of the next 20 years and and i think that is what we ought to aim at um i think it's doable a lot of uh, good things are in place and and a few more need to be done and and then we can get there uh political challenges most certainly uh, we can talk about that in q and a so let me stop here uh, uh, sorry i took probably a little longer than i had intended but i think we still have time to to do q and a so back to you uh, um avir or siddharth thank you professor um that was a great talk uh, and we have quite a few questions um so we will sort of give these um, attendees the option to unmute and ask the questions themselves um so just a moment um manas would you like to ask your question yes thank you um thank you for the talk professor am i audible yeah um so you spoke about how um the focusing on heavy investments um was had been a mistake so i was curious about what could have been a better alternative as a start to an independent nation uh well you know i would of course you know in hindsight this is hindsight i would have never uh, pursued self sufficiency uh and uh, i i would have um, uh, um uh um, not gone through the planning route uh, i i i would have uh, allowed the markets to function a bit better uh, the government had plenty of things to do they had education to do they had health to do they had uh, 
the entire administration to do defense, uh, the admin, uh, you know, law and order, uh, uh, far uh, lots of things uh, uh, to do. Uh, I would have allowed, therefore, you know, manufacturing to, you know, and we, by the way, had inherited fairly decent, actually, manufacturing base. Uh, uh, four to five decades, uh, 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 textiles industry, for example, had been uh, 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 evolving. It was competitive, you know, it, they were, it was an export industry. Textiles accounted for 10% of our exports at the time. Uh, India's share, actually, in the global uh, uh, exports was close to about 2.5% at that time. So I would have allowed that to to take root and 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 continue, not not gone for small and uh, the small and medium scale industries. But even then, all right, you know. So general consensus was that uh, 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 that that uh, uh, you really couldn't trust the markets. And nobody post independence, you know, around post Second World War, nobody started actually as a, uh, except Hong Kong, which which was a very special case. It started as an totally open economy. So, so, so even if that were the case, you know, uh, you go a little bit, the more conventional import substitution, you know, uh, 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 which would have been the labor intensive industries, you know, some of the labor intensive products that we were importing, maybe there you just introduce some protection tariffs, et cetera. That's one thing I would have done. The other very, very important mistake we made was uh, that, you know, in 1958, early 1958, when foreign exchange began to run out, uh, uh, we adopted foreign exchange budgeting, meaning basically exchange control. That's equivalent to foreign exchange control. I would have devalued in a massive way at the time. The economy was broadly in okay shape at the time. You know, the, the second the opportunity that came devaluation when we did 1965, 1966. At that time, the economy was in serious doldrums. And so, so as a result, the response uh, to, to devaluation took a long, long time, by which time the political consensus withered away. Uh, but, but 1958 was a very good time to actually massively devalue the rupee uh, and then give a hand to the, uh, to the manufacturing exports. And then gradually by early 60s, I would have started opening up. But you see the whole framework, once you had adopted socialism, uh, self-sufficiency and heavy industry, Everything that we still see as, as a problem uh, today followed from that. Uh, you know, labor laws have been so difficult to, 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 to reform still. <laughs> That's coming from then. Uh, because it also impacted the entire intellectual framework. The, the, you know, I mean, 2013, we wrote a very socialist land acquisition act. I mean, you look at that land acquisition act, it's a totally very socialist kind of land acquisition act. Right to Education Act, very socialist. But why did that happen? I think that's just the intellectual kind of uh, 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 baggage that that continues uh, uh, to uh, that we continue to carry from from uh, whose foundations basically were laid down at, at that time. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for that, Professor. Um, we'll. Ask our next attending. Sashank, you can unmute and ask your question. Yeah, uh, hello, Professor. So I just wanted to um, ask you that you said that the self-sufficiency at the time of the independence was not probably the right objective of, uh, of planning and that uh, eventually led to a slow growth rate. So given that would Prime Minister Modi's the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan cause a similar slowdown to the economy because it also focuses on self-sufficiency and things like that? So wait a minute, uh, let me, I don't know whether you said I didn't say that self-sufficiency was the right objective. No, it was not. Uh, I, I hope that's what you said. Uh, you know. No, it was not the right objective. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, good, 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 good. good. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I think it's not, you know, what prime minister said as self-sufficiency, I, I see it quite differently, uh, frankly, you know. This was uh, in a speech during uh, COVID, and, and he was talking to the larger nation. I, I, I don't think he was even thinking in terms of, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, in terms of trade policy at the time. I think that was a call to the nation that we have to stand up on our feet. And, and he's, uh, as far as I understand, he, he's using the term equivalent of self-reliance as opposed to self-sufficiency. And I, I do make a big, big distinction between self-reliance and self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency means that you've got to produce everything you consume. 
and therefore not engage with the rest of the world. Self-reliance simply says that you know you have to be on your feet, meaning you have to pay for what uh, 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 what you consume. That's simply saying that you got to export for what you import. Uh, uh, so balance your uh, uh, accounts, basically. You know, don't don't count on aid and so forth. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm self-reliant here myself as a household. Uh, I'm not self-sufficient, meaning that you know. I, 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 uh, I, I sell my services to Columbia University, which pays me my salary, and I use that salary to buy whatever I need uh, from rental to food and what, what have you. Uh, uh, so, so that's about it, you know, and, and so that's how I kind of interpret self-reliance I mean, self as opposed to self-sufficiency. Now, is the government actually trying to move in the direction in which we were trying to move in the 1950s? Yes. I think you know, and and the the, the whole idea of the, the India's protection return to protectionist policies predates the speech by Prime Minister, you know, which was during COVID. Uh, uh, he spoke, I think, it was in May or something, right? You know, uh, uh, but but uh, 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 pro, uh, the Indian tariffs were being rolled back starting almost in 2015 and so forth. It accelerated in 2018 and and further further down. Uh, but but that history is a bit longer. So, so I don't connect the two personally. Now, of course, you know, it's possible that the bureaucrats simply use that term uh, and, and even the ministers who don't understand any better, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> uh, uh, use the term Atmanirvar Bharat to promote protectionism and self-sufficiency, um, that's possible. Uh, but, but the outcome wise, you know, not, there is a difference from 1950s. You know, I don't think we are going to go back to three, four percent kind of growth. I think you know we will still even in today because we are not, you know, the, 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 uh, we are not in that kind of closed economy model. Even with protectionism having gone up, still India, India's economy is pretty open. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you, your uh, uh, trade to GDP ratio is uh, 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 about 40 percent at least still now. Uh, compared with you know 15% in 1991 so 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 we we are uh, more open and the exchange rate is flexible exchange rate that is very big difference so you know we are not into this danger of falling into for, foreign exchange control uh, uh, so the exchange rate will to some degree try to compensate for uh, the protectionism that we do on on trade side, it can in principle. If if the RBI is is, is, is if the governor RBI runs it smartly, you know he would let rupee devalue, uh, so that at least the exporters' interests get uh, 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 get protected through the exchange rate. So so we are not in that kind of world, but the, but but you know, can we grow at ten percent? Yes, if we go open and we privatize, we uh, uh, including the public sector banks. We can go to 10%. Um, but will we go to 10% without opening up, without some of these uh, uh, other reforms? No, I think, you know, but 7% but uh, plus is completely feasible, uh, even within the current uh, policy regime. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now, um, Dr. Anbergen, you can uh, unmute and ask your question. Sir, uh, sir, good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Anbergen from Presidency College. Uh, there is a wide gap, uh, widening uh, gap between the rich and poor and uh, rural and urban in recent decades. How this will be shot out in the future course? Uh, kindly tell, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Look, you know, for, for a poor country, I worry about poverty more than inequality uh, because poverty is something we can do about, uh, you know, we can do something about poverty and we have successfully done that. I mean, I didn't touch on that aspect, but uh, uh, with growth, uh, first of all, you pull up uh, uh, the people uh, uh, who are really down below with higher incomes. Uh, that has happened. There's no question, you know, your uh, expenditure survey show that uh, consistently. 
um, and and you also have more revenues. So you, you can uh, 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 you, you, you can carry out anti-poverty programs on a large scale. You got Narega, you got transfers that are happening to the poor. Uh, water, uh, taking water to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, the, the, the tap water to the households, uh, all the good, you know, the, the LPG to the poor households, all that you can do. So poverty is something we can combat, we are combating, and, and that ought to be anyway our priority number one. Now, inequality, uh, uh, short of uh, authoritarian regimes, which uh, simply clamp down on, on the wealthy, uh, in a ruthless sort of way, uh, I know of no example personally where anybody has, you know, in a major way impacted inequality itself. Only through poverty. I mean, through poverty you do because you know you 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 uh, uh, bring the poor up, and that also reduces inequality. You bring the rural incomes up, you reduce inequality, uh, urban rural. Uh, so through that, yes. But if you are thinking in terms of some sort of Gini coefficient, et cetera, in any case, that moves very, very slowly. And if you look at India's Gini coefficient, it has shown up and down and all. You know, there's no clear trend. But anyway, I don't think you should really worry so much about the Gini coefficient because ultimately, if, if I look at the people, do they, I mean, there is a form of inequality about which they worry. But that is not the form of inequality about which we kind of get worried meaning we, the, the armchair economists, uh, 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 you know, take for example, between Bihar and Kerala, what is the pattern of migration? People go from Bihar to Kerala, not from Kerala to Bihar, simply because Kerala offers prospects of better income. But the income distribution, if I measure by Gini, that's way more equal in Bihar than it is in Kerala. Kerala is actually, you know, if I go by the last, unfortunately, expenditure survey we have uh, uh, for income distribution is 2011-12, uh, or any earlier ones, Kerala turns out to be the most unequal state measured by Gini coefficient, and Bihar turns out to be most equal. But it's because Kerala uh, in Bihar, almost everybody is poor, vast majority are poor, and and, and so the income distribution effect, you know, is not that uneven. Uh, compared to you know what you see in Kerala, in Kerala everybody is re receiving uh, lots of people. Not everybody, lots of people are receiving uh, uh, remittances. Almost if it's, uh, every third household receives some sort of remittances from outside. Uh, so the income distribution in Kerala, expensive distribution is, is is much worse in Kerala than it is in Bihar. So it's a very different kind of inequality. You know, I get worried when my colleague, you know, I do the same work and my colleagues do the same work and I I'll get a smaller salary increase than them. That, that is this inequality I kind of get very agitated about. But the fact that the Bloomberg makes another billion dollars tomorrow or next year, that is hardly of any consequence to me. I don't get agitated by that. Thank you, Professor. Um, we'll take a couple of questions from the Q&A box. Um, okay, we'll start with post-COVID, we've seen a good rebound of the economy. However, there are two aspects that are worrying. The private consumption expenditure has still not recovered and is still below pre-COVID level. The other aspect is the government expenditure. It is also still below pre-COVID level, despite some big ticket announcements by the government. Could you throw some light on these? Okay, I, as far as I recall, and I'm going to check this even as, as I speak, uh, if I can pull out the file, uh, the government expenditure, I think, has returned to the pre-COVID level or a little above that. Uh, it has to, uh, because, you know, at the end, they all have to add up. If GDP is, is above the pre-COVID level, <laughs> enough has to be above pre-COVID level. So the government expenditure, check it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking for it. I'll, I'll check. But government expenditure has come, and anyway, that's the uh, uh, government can very easily do that. Um, uh, uh, but uh, consumption is not. Now, you know, first of all, I like to see focus a bit more on the glass, uh, half glass that's full rather than empty. And I'll first do that. That look, you know, the big thing to me is investment. Uh, Macroeconomists who always look at the short term, and especially in India, you know, they all try to look at, the, uh, at, at this uh, Keynesian uh, lens. So the consumption, 
So, so you're looking aggregate demand, but aggregate demand can't necessarily drive when your problems are on the supply side. And, and COVID shock really has been as much a supply shock, shock much more so as a supply shock than the demand shock. So uh, 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 the key thing is that the investment actually, uh, uh, including private investment has returned. And that is something to, to, to be happy about. The government expenditure, as I said, I'm sort of looking for, for the, 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 the um, uh, uh, let's see if I can, uh, yeah, okay, got it, very good. Okay, so let's check the government expenditure if you're right about that. Yeah, government expenditure is healthily above, you know. So uh, uh, it, it, it was 15.4 lakh crore in 1920, and it's now 17.07 crore. So almost uh, uh, one and a half crores, one and a half lakh crores, which is one and a half trillion uh, uh, rupees uh, higher uh, than, than, than in pre-COVID. So, so government expenditure is healthily coasting along and uh, your, your investment has picked up. And then it's a matter of adding up. Somewhere it's going to show up, you know, ultimately C plus I plus C plus X minus M. Uh, and X minus M has probably improved a little bit, uh, but, but surely not, not, not by enough. Uh, and so, you know, the residual is private consumption. It's going to show up there. Uh, uh, so it'll come back, you know, I think private consumption to some degree is being impacted also from the financial factors, which I mentioned, particularly the NBFC problems, you see, because a lot of the big ticket, you know, durables consumption, right? A lot, most middle-class people borrow to buy these things. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and often NBFCs are involved in that chain of, of lending in, in the consumer, retail consumer. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that's where part of the problem is. So that sector is recovering, but it, I have no, prob no doubt actually it'll come back, it'll come back. I think, you know, the big thing is the, that the GDP itself has returned to nine point, uh, you know, grown 9.2% and returned well above pre-COVID levels. So, so I'm not, not worried. I think the private consumption will come back. Thank you, Professor. Um, do you think we have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so I'll pick up another anonymous question. Uh, Professor, what are your views on India directly mimicking China's growth model to an extent? Example, our adoption of the PLI scheme. Is there something that India ought to do differently? And is there even something like an India unique model, uh, growth model, or is it just a myth? Yeah, so I mean, I personally don't think, you know, PLI, uh, Kinds of schemes will lead to the the uh, the um, the big kind of uh, China style um, growth. I mean, frankly, you know, uh, we have already tried this in mobile sector. So we are pretty, you know, that's import substitution basically. That's a conventional import substitution model, and PLI is nothing different. I mean, you know, remember that when you increase tariff you are increasing prices domestically. Uh, so, so what the domestic sellers, I mean, the only difference in between a subsidy and tariff is that tariff also raises the price for the consumer and, and subsidy doesn't raise the price for the consumer. Uh, that's the only difference. But as far as producer is concerned, subsidy and protection work in the same way. They increase the profitability for the producers. So you will create, you know, uh, domestic, you will create a domestic industry. There is no doubt, but that will be at the expense of somebody else. I mean, in the end, capital goes into the protected sector. It's going to come from the unprotected sectors. <laughs> in the end, your capital is limited, uh, and and the protected sector, in so far as it's the inefficient sector, you are taking capital out of more efficient sector into inefficient sector. That's not a smart thing to do. Um, uh, so, so I, you know, and, and it only postpones the real problems. I think, you know, if, 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 you, if we feel that mobile industry ought to be very competitive in India uh, and it's not competitive, then subsidy is not the problem. It, 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 it's, 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 it, it, there is something else. They are high cost producers. <laughs> I mean, you know, to, to, to allow high cost producers to operate. So by giving them more money, they will do it and they'll be happy to do it. 
But the point is that are they going to sustain that? And and the history tells you. I mean, you know, I've done a whole book on free trade and prosperity, uh, uh, looking at uh, all the successful cases uh, uh, from Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, China. There are five of those, uh, and then you can add Japan if you want to go to industrial country. Uh, none of them have succeeded, you know, by by uh, through these pure subsidies. Go governments always do give subsidies because obviously you want to be part of what is you know a good good thing and so then you can make a claim that yeah we did it through our subsidies but but largely it's the policies that have to drive you, you know uh, uh, and mobile is a good example to me which is a lot of production has happened but none of the domestic indian producers today is a potential export powerhouse if exports ever take off on in, uh, exports of mobile from india those will come largely from you know the 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 the, the south korean or or uh, uh, you know largely samsung or or, or some chinese companies not, not uh, indian manufacturers basically are happy that okay you know i got the domestic market uh, because uh, the tariff keeps out the imports uh, and uh, i got the subsidy so i'll you know coast along you you take those away and then see whether they become, whether they're able to survive. But we'll never take them away then. It becomes very difficult. You know, once you've created an industry, you want it to survive. So therefore you don't take it off. But look at I mean, the classic example in India is the auto industry. For 75 years has been protected. Today, 125% tariffs. So when Elon Musk is saying, you know, please, if you want me to come in, lower the tariff, <laughs> it, 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 it is symptomatic of that, that, you know, uh, with 125%, you know, anybody can uh, assemble an automobile, you know, you and I can probably assemble an automobile and be competitive within the domestic market. Question is that, you know, can we compete in the globally? Global share of in, uh, autom in automobile exports in Indi uh, of Indian companies is not even fully 1%. You know, I mean, even the overall share India has in exports is 1.7 percent. So it, 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 the automobile is is a, is a very good case actually of import substitution, not having not produced uh, uh, successes. Only in India we keep thinking that the auto industry is such a great success. But but how is it a great success when it charges one and a half times the prices in India uh, uh, of what everybody else uh, pays for outside India for the same car and probably better quality. So uh, I, I, I don't think that's, you know, the, the projection, the subsidies, they are basically postponing the real change that you need to make. Uh, and we tried that look, you know, for 40 years till 1990. I mean, finally, you know, we, I thought we got onto the right uh, path by becoming liberal starting in 1991. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know, and, and this happens, of course, in the history of countries. What happen, you know, often what happens is that once you have achieved some success, imports as a proportion of GDP rise. And then, of course, the domestic producers uh, uh, reconfigure. They say that, oh, why are you importing so many products? We can produce it domestically. So, you know, why don't you just protect us? So that is how it, the, the process kind of reasserts itself. That since imports have expanded, I mean, you know, we were buying what 200 million mobiles every uh, every year. I, I'm guessing, you know, I don't know the numbers. We were buying a very large, uh, you know, number of mobiles every year, uh, and very large proportion of that was coming from abroad. So it's very easy for the domestic potential producers to go in and tell the telecom the, the, the telecommunications ministry that why are we importing these? We can manufacture it, you know, just provide us protection. But you know who are we protecting? Certainly not the buyer. Buyer wants free. You know wants to import. You're not protecting the buyer. You're not, of course, uh, uh, protecting the guy who is selling you. You're protecting a third party here, who says I will produce them. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we do have quite a lot of questions left, so I think what we can do is we can email you, uh, these to no, you. No, no, no! Don't email me. You can okay. ask me one or two more because I'll okay, not, okay. you know, writing answers is, 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 as you can see, you know, every one of these questions doesn't have an obvious three line answer. Right. right? right so, right. yeah. We'll, we'll recognize one or two more. Uh, uh, Dr. Marxia 
if you can ask your question yeah, we have allowed you to speak sorry we can't hear you okay if there are audio issues i can just read the question out from the q a box yeah um, yeah so um, Dr. Maxia asks, uh, what could be the competencies and strategies that are required for Indian manufacturing and agriculture sector to achieve cost leadership by Indian companies? The good policies. I think at the end of the day, there is no substitute for good policies. We call the entrepreneurship. I don't think entrepreneurship is ever lacking in India. Uh, 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 you know, so it, it is. It is an environment issue, right? Because. Indians who are in the United States are no different from Indians who are in India. Uh, and, and you know that uh, the, the, the phenomenal success that software industry has achieved in India they had to do with the atmosphere. You see, you know, when software industry came up, it was an open industry. You know, there was no protection, nothing. <laughs> it was purely done by entrepreneurs. The government provided probably the 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 the, the, the what is it called the backbone on which the the data were uh, were uh, being transmitted, uh, but other than that, it was entrepreneur driven. So you need to basically you know unshackle the entrepreneurship in India, which still faces you know the the bureaucratic uh, regulatory system in India is so complex. Most foreign investors, you can see, you know, they, they want to go into the stock market more than uh, actual production, or they would do private equity. Uh, you see very few manufacturing guys want to come in from abroad and locate in India and be themselves 100%, you know, foreign owned manufacturers in India. It's because the system is so Byzantine. Is as difficult, you know, even a lot of, you know, deregulation has happened, but still, you know, so, so that's one area, but labor laws I've talked about, you know, we still need to another 5% to be done. Uh, 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 good progress there has happened, but uh, also, you know, you, you, you got to un uh, li sell off all the public sector enterprises because they also become source of protection. You see, if, if the government is producing steel and steel doesn't do well, First thing I do is uh, impose a tariff on steel. Second thing I do is I compel railways to buy my steel. You know, but that's not how you build up. So, so, so anything that is in the way of emergence of large scale manufacturing needs to be looked at. You know, why firms in India are dwarfs? I mean, sometimes we say that, you know, we, we produce, we don't produce giants, we produce dwarfs. Uh, these are firms that don't grow. Uh, uh, and and, and we, it, it's a firm size, which is a very big issue, uh, at least in my thinking. Uh, so so it, it ultimately goes to goes to policies. Thank you, Professor. Um, so we'll just take one last question from Saptarishi Dhanuka. Uh, I'll just read it out in the interest of time. Uh, how compatible is sustainability and environmental goals with economic growth slash development for India? Yeah, that's a large, very large question. Uh, so far, you know, the way I would put it is that uh, 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 the real urgency we have in India is to clean up the cities. Uh, uh, you know, the last I looked at the data is about 2018, I think, or 19. And about, you know, eight of these most polluted cities, eight of the 10 most polluted cities around the world were in India. That is the extent, you know, and, and some, you know, very small cities like Gaya. <laughs> Gaya is one of those 10 cities. Um, uh, I, I, I think that's where I, I feel is very important because you've got massive population, not you know massive, but uh, very large populations in there. Uh, and, and these are really you know, centers of pro uh, high productivity and all uh, cities tend to be. Um, and, and if people can't uh, uh, you know, um, uh, be healthy in, in, the, in the cities, that is to me the most important thing. So that's where I would focus. This is a difficult problem un undoubtedly. Uh, but uh, uh, and then therefore, you know, so I'm not getting into what I think are possible solutions. But uh, but that's where I would really focus on. Now, is there sustainability? Yes, you know, if 
to me, I mean, in a way, I sometimes say that, you know, there is some redundancy in the term sustainable development, you know, if it's not sustainable, then it's not development. Uh, it, it has to be sustainable. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, after all, look at all the other countries. Uh, uh, I mean, now even China is beginning to clean up a bit, bit, a bit more. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, as incomes rise, we, we do clean up. But, but in India, we have gone, you know, very quickly for the cities. Air has gone uh, foul very quickly, very early at, at relatively low income level. Uh, and that has to do with very large concentrations. And also, you know, the, India has done the, always this big mistake of building cities that are all horizontal. I mean, even Bombay is not vertical, it's so horizontal, meaning that, you know, you've you got one story, two story buildings. So, which means that, of course, you know, you have to spread the city sprawl, the, the, the city sprawl that you see, uh, uh, extensive, well, then you are going to drive in, drive out. Uh, 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 and and uh, since public transportation is not that great, it's always it, it ends up being private transportation, which is you know small little cars, scooters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, we should build more vertical cities, you know. So so create space going vertically up, so that you know you, do, you then don't sprawl so so far out. I mean, look at Bombay, you know, you floor space index of one point three in South Bombay. I mean, South Bombay is the hub of activity. But who can live in South Bombay? Nobody can because they don't let you build any high, uh, tall buildings. Uh, everywhere, it is the city center where the buildings are the tallest. India is unique where we allow taller buildings. If we allow taller buildings, they're all outside the city center. City center is very low. Look at Delhi. I mean, you know, how vast uh, spread out it is. So that's a recipe, actually, you know, that kind of city uh, planning is a recipe for uh, environmental pollution to thrive. So those are the things, I mean, anyway, to a solution. But in the end, yes, development by definition to me has to be sustainable, you know, otherwise not development. Thank you so much, Professor. This talk has been very insightful. Uh, and I think that's clearly visible in the number of questions we have. I mean, this talk has created a lot of buzz. Uh, I'll now hand it over to Aviral for the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking out the time to attend this talk. Uh, we hope you learned and enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, thank you for all the to all the members of the Economic Society to make this happen. Of course, thank you to the professor for this very insightful talk. Uh, we hope to see you again, professor, sometime in the future. And uh, everyone else, thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Do well and 